Hidden Figures, The True Story of Four Black Women and the Space Race by New York Times bestselling author Margot Lee Shitterly with Winford Cockling, illustrated by Laura Freeman. Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, Katherine Johnson, and Christine Darden were good at math. Really good. In 1943, the United States was at war, World War II. Dorothy Vaughn wanted to serve her country by working for the National Advisory Committee of Aeronautics, the government agency that designed airplanes. Having the best airplanes would help America win the war. Making airplanes fly faster and higher and safer meant doing lots of tests at the agency's Langley Laboratory in Hampton, Virginia. Tests meant numbers, numbers meant math, and math meant computers. Today, we think of computers as machines, but in the 1940s, computers were actual people like Dorothy, Mary, Catherine, and Christine. Their job was to do math. Because Dorothy was black and a woman, some people thought it would be impossible for her to get a job as a computer. She lived in Virginia, a southern state, where laws segregated or kept space apart from black people and white people. They could not eat at the same restaurants. They could not drink from the same water fountains. They could not use the same restrooms. They could not attend the same schools. They could not play on the same sports teams. They could not sit near each other in movie theaters. They could not marry someone of a different race. But Dorothy didn't think it was impossible. She was good at math, really good. She knew she was the right person for the job. She applied and the laboratory offered her a position as a computer. At work, black and whites were kept apart. The white computers worked in one building and Dorothy and the other black computers worked in a different building in their separate office. Even though they worked on the same kind of assignments, the black computers and the white computers used separate bathrooms and ate at separate lunchrooms. America won the war in 1945, but Dorothy stayed on the job, still trying to make airplanes faster and safer. By 1951, the Americans and the Russians were competing to see who could build the best planes. That meant more experiments and more numbers. Lots and lots of numbers and more numbers meant the need for more computers. That's when Mary Jackson got a job as a computer at Langley. She worked in a group that tested model airplanes in wind tunnels. A wind tunnel was a machine like a huge metal box with a powerful fan attached. Mary put model planes in the wind tunnel and blasted them with air from the fans. This experiment helped her group improve their design on the models before building full-size airplanes. Mary wanted to become an engineer, but officials said it was impossible. Most of the engineers at the laboratory were men. And to become an engineer, Mary needed to take high-level math classes, but she wasn't allowed to go inside the white schools where the classes were taught. But Mary was good at math, really good. And she refused to give up. She got permission to enter the school building and take the math classes. And she earned good grades because she didn't give up. Mary Jackson became the first African-American female engineer at the laboratory. Katherine Johnson was good at math and always asked lots of questions. In 1953, she applied in the laboratory for a computer job and was placed on a team 
that tested actual planes while they were flying in the air. Their research was used to figure out ways to improve future plane crashes. In one of her first projects, she learned how to analyze turbulence or dangerous gusts of winds. No one knows how many lives her work may have helped save. Catherine wanted to help the group prepare its research reports, so she asked if she could go to the meeting with the other experts on her team. Her boss told her it was impossible. Women aren't allowed to attend meetings, he said. But Catherine knew she was good at math as anyone else, maybe better. So she asked him again, and again, and again. Catherine asked her boss so many times that he figured he finally invited her to the meeting. Catherine was good at math, really good. And because she found to be treated the same way, she fought to be treated the same way as men, she became the first woman in her group to sign her name to one of the group's reports. In the 1950s, the Langley Laboratory bought a machine computer that could do math faster than the human computers. At first, these machines made mistakes. Dorothy learned how to program the machines so that they got the right answers. She taught the women in her group how to program the computers, too. In 1957, Russia launched a satellite known as Sputnik into orbit around the Earth. The United States started building satellites to explore space, too. For years, the laboratory had used math to design airplanes. Now it would need math to create spaceships as well. The government decided to change the agency's name from the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy told Congress, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. A man on the moon? But the first step to getting a man on the moon was to send an astronaut around the Earth. NASA was going to need to hire more space experts and more people who were good at math. Really good. The people at the laboratory had to work together from morning to night to figure out how to send astronaut John Glenn into space and bring him back home to Earth safely. Katherine Johnson knew she could use math to help. Tell me, where do you want his spaceship to land? And I'll tell you where to launch it, Katherine told her boss. Katherine helped calculate the trajectories or pathways that rockets traveled through space. She had a plan, Glenn's exact route, from takeoff in Florida to splash down in the Atlantic Ocean. There was no room for error. No one was better than Catherine at solving these tricky math problems. Days before his mission, John Glenn wanted Catherine to double check the machine computer's trajectory calculations to make sure it hadn't made any mistakes. When Catherine said the numbers were correct, Glenn was ready to go. On February 20th, 1962, Glenn blasted off into space, circled the earth, and made his way home safely. Meanwhile, laws began to change so that black and white students could go to school together. Blacks fought for the right to sit beside whites on the bus and to drink from the same water fountains. At the, at the laboratory, black and white computers started working together in the same offices, eating at the same lunch tables and using the same bathrooms. Black and white moviegoers could sit next to each other in the same theater. Across the country, people started to think about ways to bring equality to all Americans.
Catherine Darden was good at math and she loved electronic computers. She started working at Langley in 1967. Catherine wanted to become an engineer and thanks to Dor Dorothy, Mary and Catherine, she knew it was possible. Eventually she became an engineer for supersonic airplanes, planes flying faster than the speed of sound. But her first job was to help with NASA's mission to the moon. The people at the laboratory prepared for years to send astronauts to the moon. About 238,900 miles away from the Earth. Finally, on July 20th, 1969, the world watched as the three men arrived at the moon in their Apollo 11 spacecraft. That's one small step for men one giant leap for mankind, said astronaut Neil Armstrong when he stepped onto the dusty surface. But it was also a giant leap for Dorothy, Mary, Catherine, and Christine, and all of the other computers and engineers who had worked at the lab laboratory over the years. The moon landing was a success from takeoff to splashdown. But there was no time to rest. Once NASA landed astronauts on the moon, their people at the laboratory began dreaming of sending humans to other planets, such as Mars or Jupiter or Saturn. They started to imagine hyper fast space planes that would travel around the Earth at seven times the speed of sound. The next adventure wouldn't be easy and would require lots of tests and lots more numbers, but Dorothy as possible.